Welcome everyone uh, to today's CCC OER Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources uh, webinar on sustainable OER course design. Um, my name is Matthew Bloom. I will be moderating a panel discussion today. Um, I'm English faculty at Scottsdale Community College and one of the tri chairs of the Open Maricopa Project. Um, before we get started, um, I wanted to uh, kind of share the agenda with you here. Um, I'll provide a very brief overview of who we are at CCC OER, um, and then we'll give the panelists an opportunity to introduce ourselves, and then we will go into today's discussion, which I think will be um, hopefully very, you know, revealing about some interesting strategies and, and um, um, experiences related to designing courses. Um, so, first of all, CCC OER is a North America-based node of the global open education uh well open education global which is a um, an organization that you know has nodes all across the world cccr specific uh, oer specifically is um focused on supporting its members uh in their initiatives and networking and things along those lines um, generally speaking as it says here um, we focus on the expansion of you know actually global awareness, even though we are focused on um, North American institutions um, and access to OER. We do quite a bit in terms of uh, professional development um, and helping our members and others uh, do things like professional development and, and other kinds of events like that as well. Um, and of course, the you know primary goal of anything we do in education and open education too is, is uh, to improve uh, student equity and student success. And so um, just to give you a sense of our membership, we have um, 108 members in 36 states, and you can see there's even some um, across the border as well. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our panelists. We have, um, I, we'll just go through one by one here, and, and I'll give you the opportunity to, to kind of introduce yourself. So um, Ashley, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, aloha. I'm coming from... Um the island of Oahu. Uh, I teach at Leeward Community College, which is within the University of Hawaii system. Um, I am a psychology and human development faculty. Um, I've been to lots of training. Um, I know Matthew said he wanted, we wanted to share a little bit about our institution. Um, we are proud that this semester we are 58% um, of our classes are taught using OER, textbook zero. Um, as far as me personally, I'm also an OER research fellow right now working on a project using photography in my class as an open pedagogy assignment. So um, I'm just really uh, lucky and honored to be here. Um, and I'll pass it on to the next one. That's fantastic. 58% is amazing. That is like really cool. I don't know if I don't know if we'd ever be able to get there at our institution. That's really fantastic. Okay, so um, next up is Bill. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, yeah, Bill Hemig. I'm Dean of Learning Resources and Online Learning at Bucks County Community College. We're in southeastern Pennsylvania, the next county up from Philadelphia. Um, our FTE is currently about 5,000 and has been dropping, but I'm happy to say our summer enrollments have been up a little bit. So I'm, I'm a little optimistic that that trend may, might uh, turn around. Um, we started our OER initiative in 2016 with a two-year grant from our college foundation. And from the very beginning, our major concern was not just adoption, but um, completely redesigning LMS templates to incorporate zero textbook cost um, resources. Um, once the money ran out, we had to figure out ways to keep that momentum going. And we've been fairly successful, I think. Um, we were a bellwether finalist this year, not a winner, but a finalist for, for that very thing, so that we felt good about that. Um, today, we have, as just as a product of our initiative, we have 25 courses running with OER sections. Uh, we've saved our students over $2 million. Um, in the meantime, other faculty have, who didn't want to redesign courses have just been adopting, so taking that into account, um, we're saving our students about $600,000 a year currently, and we now have three zero textbook cost certificate pathways, and we're getting close with a couple of our associate's degree programs. 
Okay, thank you so much, Bill. Um, next up is Regina. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, everyone. I'm Regina here Holzer, and I'm one of the instructional designers and also one of the open education advocates at Bucks County Community College in Pennsylvania, as Bill said. And as an ID, I work directly with the faculty on designing their OER course templates in our learning management system, which is Canvas. And as an OE advocate, I try to learn as much as I can about open education and spread the word with uh, my partner. There's another uh, open education advocate here. So um, at this point, we, Bill had already gave you the rundown of uh, our courses, our templates, and along with my co-advocate, we look to the near future to help faculty with remixing and revising open textbooks for eventually publishing. So that's the next step. Nice to be here with everyone. Great, thank you very much. And last but not least, certainly is uh, Christine. Uh, how is it over there on the other side of town, Christine? Uh, actually, it's nice and cool out at the moment, which is, of course, a surprise, that lovely drop in temperature. So my name is Christine Jones, and I teach at Glendale Community College, which is one of the many colleges in the Maricopa Community College system. And I'm also uh, recently appointed Director of Open Educational Resources for Faculty at Glendale Community College in charge of our new Near Z degree program. Um, we've been vetting through our associate degree programs that transfer into university and finding pathways for students to be at or near oh, uh, zero costs for transferring into their university classes. We know that some of the classes don't work. So that's why we called it near Z degree. Um, but we are now happy to uh, be able to let the students know that our AJEC A and AJEC S pathways are completely OER or near OER and are we're two classes away from our AJEC B. So those are our core courses, those those uh, general education courses. Our pathways are set. So then our next step is going to be. Uh, getting those pathways started with the students. So we are developing, working with students and we're working with different departments across the college, but we are developing the pathways so every student will have the opportunity. And I'm sorry, I didn't say, yeah, this is in Arizona. I'm in Arizona. <laughs> Great, so thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop the screen share because we um, are going to just have kind of a discussion and there's no reason to have the slides up here in March. Um, just see everybody's live, you know, moving faces. Um, so uh, the, I guess what I want to do is just go ahead and just start the conversation off. Um, you know, as some of you, I'm sure, here um, attending or wondering, you know, kind of like, well, what do we mean by sustainability? This is a question, this is a term that's used quite often. And I guess, you know, sometimes people kind of use it in completely different contexts. Um, I do have a specific question later on where we'll kind of get into resource allocation in, in, you know, in specific, but just generally speaking right now, I'm wondering if we should maybe start off just, I'd like to ask all of you, you know, kind of, you know, what does it mean to you, you know, for an open educational resource to be designed for sustainability? Well, I have a pretty simple answer. I mean, for us, because we're designing entire course templates for, for the LMS, the objective for us is to create something that can be adopted by others with minimal editing. We, we pay the faculty to, we pay faculty members to design an entire template for the Canvas LMS. And then at the end of the process, we ask them to upload it to Canvas Commons. So not only their own colleagues, but anybody with access to Canvas Commons can download them. And that's more likely to happen if it's a complete course, if it's kept up, if, if it's, if they don't have to do, for, the, basically we pay somebody to do the work. So a lot of other people don't have to. And I'll have to second that because I work with Bill and I help the faculty with their courses um, to develop them. And I know the work that goes into them and they are fully complete courses for our faculty to adopt. And also, as Bill mentioned, they're on Canvas Commons and we have seen that there are a large number of downloads of the course templates 
So we know other faculty from other schools must be adopting them. So we're spreading our open education around. Um, yeah, sort of along that line, I when I first came to OER, I didn't think so much about how other people would use it. I thought about what stuff I, was available to me to remix and use with my expertise and how I could like, you know, design a class around what I was most passionate about and what I thought was most important for my students. Um, but now as I've moved into more of a leadership role within my division, um, and I've been the one now hiring and, uh, you know, supervising lecturers, it has been much easier for me to hand over. And we unfortunately do not have Canvas. We have a Sakai LMS, which nobody else seems to have. Um, but so we've, so I've designed a course in, in um, Sakai and it was much easier for me to tell lecturers who had, or to ask lecturers who had never um, taught an asynchronous class online to be like, hey, I have this whole course. You can adapt it as you need. Um, so yeah, I hadn't thought about that at the front end of developing it, um, but it's been very helpful at the back end of using it, being able to pass it on to my um, lecturers. So I think another thing I always think about with uh, sustainability is including my students as like co-collaborators. Um, and that in that way, it's not on me. I mean, I'm the, the leader of the circus, right? But I like have other helpers um, in my students, seeing my students as co-collaborators in helping me keep the, the it, it updated and that kind of stuff. I have a slightly different perspective, I think, in that I'm working on several different levels with faculty, with different departments and with the administrators and trying to make sure that sustainability is working on different levels. And at the faculty level, what we're working on right now is templates for course development to make sure that every faculty knows where each piece is going. And I'm working with a, with a grant right now to develop a textbook that is modular so pieces can easily be taken out to fit other people's classes. Um, we're doing it around contextualization. So the context is in one section and easily replaceable with other contexts, which has been fantastic. Um, but I'm also at the department level where we're looking at usability, not just by residential faculty, but also adjunct faculty and making sure that it can be sustained across and to be fully customizable to those different teaching approaches. So the hybrid learning and the online learning, the live online learning and the face to face, all of which are being taught right now. And finally, <laughs> I'm also doing it at the institution level, trying to establish how we're doing promotion so that that can continue in a pattern. Um, after I'm gone, these things will continue, um, making sure that the director is not the driving force, but rather that the entire campus is the driving force behind open educational resources. Content housing support and monitored metrics, which you are working on now, so that that will be a regular thing at the institutional level. So, so it sounds to me that um, one thing that I kind of heard from a lot of you was just generally thinking of um, thinking of the development as centrally being about future users. Like essentially that's like what it is, not just about the individual faculty member who might be using it, you know, in, in that one context. And I think that having that in mind is, is really important because, you know, that's why we want to have this conversation, right? Because we, I think that we, we value just, just that, that idea. We want to try to make the material good. Um, we want people to adapt, you know, the work that we've done and, and build off of it. That's the whole purpose of sharing it. Um, so that brings us to our next question, which is, you know, the central concern for many faculty when they're choosing their learning materials is the currency and accuracy of the content, right? So the thing is, is that a lot of materials that are infused with like ephemeral or otherwise time sensitive content will more often and potentially sooner require revision and updating. So what can creators do to ensure that their materials remain current without ending up with a short expiration date? In other words, um, do you know strategies for maximizing both the currency and the lifespan of the resource at the same time? Um, I was just gonna say one way I've done this is just stay, um, 
stay involved in my teaching organization within my field. So there's an organization under APA, I'm a psychologist, right? Uh, under APA called Society for Teaching Psychology. And I've start, I'm on their listserv. I'm talking to other faculty at other places, some of whom who are not using OER, right? Um, some of whom who are like textbook writers themselves um, who are getting paid by, you know, big companies. Um, and yeah, so in that sense, going to teaching pre-conferences, I've started to love these like teaching pre-conferences, especially sometimes I have to wake up at 4 a.m. because the time zones are a little strange. But um, but yeah, I started loving these. So I've gone to at uh, I'm a developmental psychologist by by training. So I Society for Research and Child Development. I going to conferences. It's much easier now that they're virtual. Um, a lot of them have been virtual and I can keep up on research that way. Also, again, as I mentioned, building in um, kind of open-ended questions for my students. So I just had, um, I teach a psychology of gender course and one of the assignments is to watch um, Misrepresentation, which is about you know female representation in uh, media and that kind of stuff. And at this point, it's kind of dated because it's from like 2011. Um, but one of my questions in there is like, do you think anything in this has gotten better? Like now that we're looking at this 10 years later, um, has have things gotten better? And I noticed that when I just said like, have things gotten, how have things changed? I got a lot of students saying, oh yeah, things have changed and we have so many more women in Congress and blah, blah, blah. But then I adapted it just, I tweaked the assignment just a little bit to say, find me two pieces of evidence that support what you're saying. And now all of a sudden people are saying, oh, I thought things had changed, but then I looked it up. And yeah, I mean, yeah, we've gone up from like 11% to 27% in Congress, female representation, but that's still not 50%. And so I'm getting this, so I'm having them go out and look for current content about what we're studying. So that's just my example of how I've, how I've done that. But yeah, I'm eager to hear from other people because this is also something that I think about and struggle with. Um, so I'm happy, I'm eager to hear from my other panelists about that. Well, I'd like to offer something as a, a tip, a technique from an instructional designer. When I'm working with faculty, we developed a process here that they can use as a guideline for every step of the way. And one part of the process we developed, uh, it's a simple Word document, we call it the OER tracker. So as they're searching for all of their content, then they can keep track of everything that they use, the link, uh, when it was updated last, what its currency is, and also where they put it in the course and link directly to where the, the module in the course. So that's one part of it, but when they go to update their course, or when they're getting ready to teach their course for the next semester, they can go to that Word document that they have all of their links in and they can click on it and they can check everything. And so then they can look themselves to see if their content is still current. Maybe they wanna change it. Maybe they wanna change it out for something that they wanna to add to it. So that's what, we, uh, that's what we help our faculty with as instructional design. Yeah, and we do have a process in place for what we call curating the existing templates so that they don't uh, they don't start aging and nobody's really paying attention to them anymore. So yeah, we have a whole process in place for that. Another issue that comes up with us is the use of proprietary materials in the course spaces, um, links to library databases and things like that that are probably of no use to adopters outside the college. And, you know, we have to provide information that you probably won't be able to use this. And it, it does prevent a challenge to, I guess, the sustainability of the templates when, and also within the institution, sometimes databases go away, films on demand removes things without much of a, you know, <laughs> announcement. So a lot of things to keep track of, not just with the OER. One of the things that we have been working on is making sure that the different creations that are being developed are modular. So when we come across something that is like a database being removed or a source no longer able to be done, it can be quickly replaced by something and you don't have to develop the whole thing over again. And one of the ways that we're trying to do this now is to work outside of the LMS system 
and we're using press books um, mm -hmm. to make it public and available for anybody. And the way that we are setting our press books is that it can be downloaded into any format. So people can save it as a PDF, they can have it as printables and whatever, um, specifically because we recognize that people might not be able to use Canvas course shells um, we wanted to make sure that anybody who wanted to be able to use the materials could use the materials. So we still have our Canvas course shells, but we're sourcing everything off of these press books that we're creating so that it can easily be changed out directly from the press books. Great. That's a great idea, Christine. Very that good. Is something we should look at. <laughs> One thing I wanted to add, you know, it, uh, when Ashley, when you were talking about um, kind of redesigning the assignment so that it, there was like space for the students to contribute a little bit, you know, or, or I guess a way to rephrase that is putting a little bit of the task of actually discovering the content that the course is going to be about, putting that into the assignment itself and having the students do that so that so that the assignment is like automatically current because it's going to involve finding current things. And I think that that's a really smart idea. And it's similar to um, somewhat similar. I think it, there was an approach that I discovered a while back. I, I tried to design some um, of my assignments in my English courses, almost like a build the scaffolding, but build it around basically like a try to build it so that the questions might apply to any number of primary sources that you might in, you know be able to locate so then that way when in the future uh, whether it's you in the future or someone else in the future goes to use that assignment um, they're, they're not relying, they, they don't have to necessarily use the primary source that's included, right? Or they could potentially just, you know, choose the thing that they like and focus on that as well, because it's not just about currency in that sense. It's also about, you know, is somebody in the future other than me going to want to use this at all? Do they like that short story, for example? You know, maybe they wanted to pick a different short story. Mm -hmm. And so the trick, though, I think for me was to try to ask questions that were specific enough to be relevant and effective, but general enough that they could apply across the board. So you can ask questions about, you know, tone or stylistic things or, you know, meter and rhyme, that kind of stuff. Before we move on to anything else, I just wanted to address a point that Bill and Regina had brought up. Um, one of the ways we are now reviewing our materials is we are tying it to our assessment cycle. So the departments have an assessment cycle tied to, you know, um, licensing and, and, and accreditation, we're tying review of the materials at a department level to not directly to the assessment cycle, but following a similar cycle of revision and review. So it's another way that we're trying to handle things and keep everything fresh. That's fantastic. Another great idea. Bill, take note of that. Oh, I am. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and go into the next uh, the next point of discussion here. Um, this is just a general question about your experiences. So I'm just wondering if any of you um, have ever kind of had to learn the hard way about what to avoid when designing your OER for sustainability or, or usability over a longer period of time. Well, since I was talking about our process for curatorship, it, it got off to kind of a rocky start. Um, we had where I had established, um, Regina mentioned that she's um, one half of our faculty OER advocate team. And I established that position, which is load credit equivalent several years ago. And originally it was just kind of promotional in nature. So rah, rah, OER adoption, you know, coming from a faculty member rather than from an administrator, which I thought would get things more traction. Uh, but then I realized that there was really nobody minding the store as far as keeping the templates up to date. Um, the faculty would kind of fall down. We had a system in place where they'd get paid an hourly fee for up to so many hours a year to update them if necessary, but that uh, in a lot of cases that wasn't happening. So I, I added that oversight into the faculty OER advocate position and now Regina and Stacy, her her co can, her co advocate, are are minding the store basically and keeping an eye and making sure that those updates happen. Well, what we do exactly is uh, we keep a list of the course of the courses and the curator, and the curator may not necessarily be the course developer. They might have passed it on to somebody. 
And then at the end of the academic year, we review and get in touch with the department deans and get the department deans to send an email to their faculty. And they do remind them that they do get a uh, stipend up to four hours of course development. And that could be um, redesigning an entire course because everything is outdated because they're looking at it again. Or it could be just fixing a few links that were broken. So it could be on a total scale, but that's how we go about it. And I'll, I'll add something else. Um, I, there was this one course that was being, it was very lonely, nobody was using it. So I finally found another faculty member to uh, revise that course. So I'm trying to keep an eye. So one of the things that I learned the hard way involves naming conventions. Um, whether it's textbook materials or assignments or in this very particular case, uh, I develop interactive activities called H5P for my materials because I'm using Pressbooks and I can. And uh, I didn't follow naming conventions and 45 packages into developing H5Ps, I suddenly realized I, had, I couldn't tell number one from number 45 and had to go back through. I'm now up to something close to 150 different packages, but I'm following naming conventions. So I know exactly what this assignment is attached to and what the topic is about. And, it makes it so much easier to pull and switch and change or update naming conventions. Yes. Yeah, we we've had a we had a similar problem in that it, originally we were asking the faculty course designers to upload the templates to Canvas Commons, and there was no consistent titling. There was no consistent metadata. To this day, some of our templates are difficult to find in Canvas Commons. So we moved, we gave that responsibility to Bucks Online, our online learning support, and now they're in charge of titles and metadata and keeping it consistent. I was gonna say, yeah, I um I mean it's so interesting to hear this like institutional level because mine as a individual faculty member, I'm like, well, my ideas were like I had this documentary that I was using on PBS and then all of a sudden one semester it was no longer available for free on PBS or I had a student in another country who couldn't access it. Um, so that's where I know Wade put in the chat about this access of librarians having these subscriptions so that you can get this stuff. And actually one, one documentary I was using on PBS, we can't find in any of our subscription things, but I could shift it easily enough to a different one that we do have. Um, and I had this great, there was this Harvard Center for Developing Child that had this wonderful like interactive game that was like, I was like, dang, this was like something I would have found in my Pearson thing. And I was missing because I don't have the technical knowledge to develop this. Um, but it was like showing how like different interventions in the community can affect different individual children. And I had this like beautiful thing designed around like Bronf and Brenner's theory of ecological development. And they played this game blah, blah, blah. and then that went down for, for uh, maintenance like a year ago when they said it was going to be like a couple of weeks and it's still not up. So I just had to like quick design. I just use a different, a different assignment. Um, but yeah, I've had to learn the hard way. And the other thing is um, when I embed YouTube videos, I've found much easier to choose like videos that are on channels that are like, look like they're like more well-developed. So, so like channels, you know, I use like, there's, there's a couple of psychology ones that are more well-developed and it's not just like one-off video from somebody that might disappear later. Um, so I've done that. And I've also, after having done hours and hours and hours of my own captioning, editing captions on videos, um, I, now that is one of the things I look for when I look for a video to use is do they have the correct captions with the, um, oh God, what are they? Periods, commas, all that, um, punctuation, sorry. Um, yeah. Do they have all of that? Because I do not want to 
I do not want to spend my time adding punctuation to captions. Um, I wish I'm hearing now Bill and Regina. I'm like, ooh, I've been saying like, shouldn't our like accessibility people be doing this for me? So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that they are at yours and I will file that away for when I need to bring that up later, <laughs> later to people. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we've gotten right from the beginning. So it wasn't learning from bad experience, but it's good advice. Get accessibility right from the beginning because it's really hard to retrofit. <laughs> And connect with them. Absolutely connect with accessibility on your campus because they are a great contributing member to the team for recognizing accessibility issues across the board. So not just captioning, but making sure that screen readers are going to work. You know. Yeah, they've, I mean, not to harp, but they, um, yeah, we've had training on that. It's just been a lot of, oh, here, you're the course developer, so you make sure all the headings are right and all the captions are in and all this stuff and it's not I'm like no but I'm the I'm the content expert like um but yeah we are all understaffed and hiring freezes and that's that well this actually is a really fantastic segue uh because I did have a question and that kind of has to do with resource allocation um one thing I wanted to kind of point out though about this discussion is that you know, it does seem like one one thing that we sh we can always remember about you know open educational resources, just the nature of the sharing license, the open license, uh, is the ability to retain a copy of of the content. And so, you know, relying on you know library resources and and other kinds of like freely accessible things online is a really great way to get content to your students. Um, but don't forget that if you are actually working with something that is openly licensed, then you're permitted to just keep a copy and then that way you don't have to worry about those links breaking. I mean, it's just, um, it's kind of like with the YouTube videos thing. I know that um, we've had we've had folks who are developing um, content and they would find like public domain videos and um, other Creative Commons licensed videos on YouTube or elsewhere, um, like, you know, internet archive type stuff. And then they would actually download the videos and put them on their YouTube channel, like a, a YouTube playlist, you know, associated with the class. That way that, you know, everything's all packaged together there. Um, so I did want to talk about resource allocation a little bit. I mean, the the, the topic of sustainability, the, the, the definition oftentimes is, um, you know, it's oftentimes defined with respect to resource allocation and implicit in this whole idea is that we're not sacrificing future well-being for some kind of short-term comfort or short-term productivity. Um, so for projects that are funded on a specific timeline, um, you know, you know when the money's going to run out, how do we best allocate resources to ensure that we aren't burdening our future selves or future others um, with work that will need to be done in the absence of that funding? So has anybody else read the article on the intro model for sustaining OER adoption? Mm -mm. No? Okay, so this is a research article where the premise is that um, if a faculty member adopts OER, that might lead to more students enrolling or fewer students dropping. And the change in student behavior could translate into more tuition revenue for the institution as a funding source. Were such an increase in revenue to occur, the increase could potentially cover the costs of OER adoption services for faculty. And if you tie that particular article to the 2018 research on the impact of open educational resources on various student success metrics, then you get the statistically significant positives in the increase in grade averages, decline in DFW grades, and the adoption of OER. So especially with higher, uh, especially higher in traditionally underrepresented minorities, part-time students, and Pell recipients. Um, let me pull up those research article links for you guys and I'll pop them in the chat because I can see the chat going a little bit crazy mm -hmm. on those. So I'll, I'll find those. I'm sorry you guys haven't seen those articles. So let me get those really quick.
Well, it seems like it seems like maybe um, enough times. I think I counted to seven, you know, in my head, maybe quickly. But um, so I'll ask a question about the technology, technological aspect of, of, of this discussion as well. So, um, you know, how might the choices that we make in terms of technology impact the long term viability of a resource? Well, I know Regina and I were talking about this just yesterday, but sometimes, I mean, some of our faculty are more technologically adventurous than others, and they might create a course template that relies heavily on things like Nearpod and VoiceThread that some faculty might be less familiar with, so they might be a little less conducive to adopting a template that has technology that they don't feel like learning. I think that can happen. Um, I mean, of course, they're free to to do something else once they've adopted the template. They can do anything with it. But mm -hmm. yeah, in the same in the so kind of along the same lines of uh, yeah, other faculty not being some of my students um, are not as comfortable in flipping through a whole bunch of different um, different resources. So like sometimes I get comments that are like, why is there like this and then this and then that? So I've tried to like streamline it to be like one technology per assignment, right? So I'm not like trying, and I try to like, if their final project has something with technology, I try to have an assignment earlier in the semester that kind of like introduces them to it. Um, so yeah, I think that thinking about, I kind of, as a, as a psychologist, I kind of want a research study where we have students have to like click through and I want to see like how many clicks it takes to lose them. Like, will they click five times? Will they click three times? Like how many clicks, how many different links are they gonna, when do they just give up clicking? Um, so yeah, so I'm always cognizant of that as far as from a design point, from my student's point of view. Um, uh, yeah, I also teach early college classes too. And so that is a whole other system, right? Like they're used to a different learning management system in their high schools um, and switching them over having them do that, um, they're much more open to the like all the different technology um, because they just are, you know, digital natives. Um, but um, yeah, so that's how I think about it of like from the student's point of view. Um, and it has gotten better. I found that as the semester, like when I first, you know, started saying like, oh, here, do this on Flipgrid and this, this is and blah, everything. Um, I had a lot more students who were like, uh, I don't feel so good about this. And now I have like almost no students who are like that, right? Because they've just gotten used to it. Other faculty have adopted this, right? It's just like part of it. Um, I think the whole COVID-19 move to online stuff kind of shoved us a little bit faster in that direction we were already kind of going. Um, but yeah, I like to think about it from my students' point of view when I'm thinking about this too, of like, how much technology can I put on them? Is this technology, am I using this because it's like useful to the to the class or am I using this because it's just like something flashy and new and I want to try it out? Well, a small piece of that for the technology, I just thought of this. We also have a, uh, not just, we have two instructional designers here, but we have an instructional technologist who actually trains our faculty on these educational tools that are not necessarily in Canvas, which would be the Nearpod, the VoiceThread, the Kahoot, and um, if somebody was to adopt a course with those pieces in it, then we have our instructional technologist who would do a one-on-one -on -one training with that faculty member. Or if that faculty member really feels as though they, they don't wanna adopt those pieces that are technology driven, then she could help them come up with something else that they could handle, that they could, they could visualize. And then should we train them on that? So we have a, a whole, I guess this is a good place to say this, but we have, we call them the superheroes. We have a bunch of superheroes to ha have a faculty, help a faculty member develop their open educational course template. And so that includes um, a subject matter library liaison. We have one for each school. And then uh, the instructional designer who's on the project. We also have Jackie, who's the instructional technologist. We have our accessibility advocate, just the faculty accessibility advocate. She doesn't work in the accessibility department, 
with all the physical aspects of accessibility, but she works directly in the Canvas courses. Yeah, she's one of our librarians. Mm -hmm. And did I miss anybody? And the advocates, uh, Stacy and I, who helped to educate everybody about what we know about open education, point them in the right direction. So <clears throat> having a team could help uh, hold off the technology problems too. And I think that that team can go even further to additional issues that might arise. So on our team, we include um, student life representatives, people, uh, non-faculty staff members who are working directly with advisors who are part of that promotional aspect. Um, and we have peer success coaches. So at the student level, we can get help for students who might be struggling with some of these technology issues. And we have faculty volunteers that we call faculty champions who help each other with the technology that they like to use. Um, we have all kinds of really fun jam sessions or lunch and learns where that faculty member comes and just shows people how to use. So I mentioned earlier H5P. I happen to be the H5P guru on my campus. And mm -hmm. so I offer brown bag sessions where people can just show up and ask me any questions and I'll walk them through the development of their own little interactive activity. Well, and I think, and part of the, sorry, but part of this, it goes back to that resource allocation question too, um, is that I think, um, yeah, all these things, even if there's no money for it, having it be valued as this is helpful for when you go up for a promotion and all this stuff, having the institution value these things and that being something that is, right, you're, you're, you're not rewarded for it with money or awards or anything, but you're rewarded for it by this is meaningful when you go up for promotion is helpful to kind of um, instill that like culture of, of that this is important. This is an important work to do. And so um, this is important service that you've given to the college. Well, okay, and that brings us to the last question. And this is actually something that was brought up in the chat earlier as well. Um, you know, obviously the term sustainability and renewable kind of go hand in hand. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what you think about the application of open pedagogy to support, um, you know, the, the sustainability of the resources. Well, I can offer something for that. Um, and and not, that wouldn't be my position. We have a faculty member who runs um, faculty learning communities and she runs them several times a year, maybe three or four. So she gathers, I don't know, 10, 15, 17 faculty members. And oftentimes the, oftentimes the topic is open education and so now what they're being introduced to is uh, the renewable assignment, not they, they were, uh, they were, their attention was brought to the disposable assignment, how it's just used for one, one project, that's it, one student, one teacher gets to read it, and then that's it, it's gone. But now that the idea of open education and the open pedagogy is being trumpeted at these faculty learning communities. Now everybody is catching on to the assignments that they could have their students create that they could use in future courses. So, or, or a test bank that the students could put together. Um, whatever, uh, the, the uh, faculty came up with a lot of good ideas. So that's one way to, uh, bring into open, open pedagogy into your, into your institution by having faculty learning communities like we have. And with Creative Commons licensing, you can have students creating assignments, quizzes, videos, they can revise the textbook, and the students have a lot to contribute to the sustainability of the course. 
Yeah, and, and I know there was a question in the chat earlier about um, open pedagogy and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I am really uh, cognizant of that, especially our institution is a Native Hawaiian serving institution. It's our, we are primarily Asian American Pacific Islander um, population. And so that population especially is not uh, well represented in the current uh, things available. So I'm especially cognizant of bringing that in when I design courses. And then recently I've decided well, my students are part of these communities. Why not have them help me with this? And so one of our, in our intro site class, one of the first assignments when we talk about research methods is I have them do as a class, a content analysis of the photographs in the OpenStax psychology book. And they code them for race and gender. And no surprise, even though I'm sure OpenStax tried really hard, the majority of the, there's, you know, 60% white and, 80% males in the pictures. Um, and so then that leads into this open pedagogy assignment where um, I say, okay, now take a picture in your community that relates to this topic, right? And so the idea, and they, they're, they are um, given the option of applying a CC license to it. So they learn about the CC license um, and they, uh, yeah, then they this, this assignment goes throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole semester. And I've recently, we recently did a professional development kind of, it was a learning community. It was, I mean, that's what it was. We just called it mm -hmm. professional development instead. Um, but it was uh, a, a native Hawaiian um, woman who has developed this program based on using photos, but also um, putting a much more uh, indigenous native Hawaiian spin on it. Um, and uh, so she trained us in this, how to help guide students through this process. Uh, it's called Ho'ala, and it's basically just looking at things from an Indigenous perspective. And I, so that has really meshed well with my open pedagogy project already. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm really excited about that and being able to, I think that that's one of the beauties of OER and open pedagogy is you can incorporate these more Indigenous methods um, into the things and you can make it look more like your students right like everybody learns better when they see themselves in the material and so i think that's a an easy in for like you know i'm not filipino so i'm not going to the filipino uh you know big family gatherings but my students are many of my students are and that's totally related to our course content and so kind of using them as experts in their own lives and experts in um I mean, I, I feel like I also am like cheating because like psychology is so easy to like relate to people's lives, right? I'm like, well, this is way easier than like it would be for a chemist or something. Um, but but yeah, that's how I've been doing. That's how I've been doing. I've been using my, you know, striving to reflect my students in the material I give them. Um, and then also, so, so using them. And so it was just like a no brainer, right? To help have you use them as co-creators since they're the ones who are living in these communities and having these lives. And so why not have them help me make it more diverse and more representative of them? So I feel like sharing a little bit of a slightly longer ago and not at the institution that I am currently at, kind of story. Um, I had a course that I was teaching on educational technology, which of course is one of the fastest moving, you can't use that program anymore kind of situations. We had a textbook that was several iterations out of date. And I had the students help me create the textbook right from scratch. We went through the programs they were going to be using. They found the programs that they thought would be good. And we started working it together and had a textbook for the following semester that then they just spent time updating, revising, adding new information. And because it was all tech, new screenshots every single semester, new steps on how to do these things. And, and it stayed current and it stayed relevant for the entire time that I was teaching the course because it was all the students. The students were doing all of the updates, which was fantastic.
Well, thank you all so very much. We did have um, a couple questions in the chat. Um, one that recently just popped up here is um, from Leonia. It says, can we revisit tracking OER before the end? Um, so I, I, she says, I want to know more about outcomes and success metrics. So I, just, I don't know if maybe someone wants to respond to that, providing a little bit of detail about how you go about, go about tracking OER. As far as student success, um, we do occasionally um, have our institutional research people um, compare the success rates of students in OER sections from the students in non-OER sections of the same courses are actually going to be doing that um, once the semester's final grades are in. Um, then the other thing we do is do a student survey every semester for the students in those, those initiative sessions sections. I can add too that um, I know that like we we are using at Maricopa uh, Pressbooks EDU, and so we can kind of look and see, um, you know, how many people are like cloning books, you know, for their own use, um, you know, in their classrooms and stuff like that. Um, you know, that kind of our network managers can can get that information, um, and so that's also helpful in terms of just you know looking at the usage there. Um, and I also know that um, if you're talking about global usage, um, if you share something to Canvas Commons, then it will tell you how many times it's been downloaded. So you can at least, you know, get some sense of, oh, look, a hundred people downloaded it. You don't know if they're using it, but um, it can be kind of tricky. So if anyone else has any other um, questions, any of the uh, attendees, if you want, just go ahead and put some questions in the, um, in the chat. I know Wade had a question for me about the role of the accessibility advocate. Um, this is a it's a load credit equivalent position. It's actually held by one of our part time librarians, and she's paid for the equivalent of a three credit course to put that amount of time into supporting accessibility for people working. Actually, for any faculty who want want accessibility help. Um, so you know, captioning metadata for photographs, all that stuff. Um, yeah, she, and we assign her actually as part of the contract for our OER course redesigners, she's assigned as part of the um, support team. So they, they're they under contract to work with her. So the, that's how we get accessibility in there right from the beginning. Uh, Alba, you have your hand raised. Do you wanna ask your question? Yes, actually, I want to thank the people. It, it's like we were discussing things, but also everything that was going in the chat, which I kept downloading and surrogate, uh, uh, separating into what I needed to do. So I'm, I'm more here to say thank you so much for this webinar. It has been useful. It's overwhelming, but I'll get through it. <laughs> I just put in the chat with no label at all, um, a link to our uh, complete collection of faculty support documents, um, most of which were, were designed by Regina. So I have to thank her for that. I had help though. Thank you for that, Bill. I was just about to mention it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, okay, so I just wanted to, there's a couple of things to, kind of wrap up the webinar. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was a, a really uh, wide ranging discussion. And I think that um, I certainly learned of some um, things that I should probably start keeping in mind as well um, when I'm when I'm making stuff. Uh, but hopefully it has been, you know, meaningful for all the attendees. I do want to um, uh, well, the question slide that we don't need. OK, so I just wanted to say that if you're looking for some strategies or some experiences related to the higher level, like kind of strategic stuff, policy level, um, please join us on May 11th because we have a really great panel lined up uh, for that discussion um, at our upcoming webinar. And 
Also, there are different ways that you can stay connected to, uh, with CCC OER, such as, for example, um, we have our community email, which is, I, I think, probably one of the best open education resources in the world. Um, it is free to join. So even if you're not a CCC OER member, you can go on the website, you can sign up, and um, people are constantly having great conversations, asking questions, sharing resources. Um, and uh, it's, it's fantastic. And then uh, there are upcoming conferences, more webinars, like I said, and um, we have our blog as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more that you can learn. <clears throat> and the last thing is, please um, let us know what you thought about the webinar today. So by, uh, this link is right here. Also, as um, I believe Liz said in the chat, that this, uh, this recording will be available uh, for posterity. So you can always go to the website and check that out as well. And that's it for today. Thank you again to the panelists and for all of you for coming and we will see you next time.